1. Good afternoon. The uh, Oklahoma City Water Utilities Trust for October 16th, 2012 will be in order. The first item on the uh, agenda is the consideration of the minutes from the October 2nd meeting. I'll move approval. A motion and a second to approve the minutes. Are there comments or questions concerning them? Hearing none, voting please. The minutes are approved. Next item is the consent docket. Um, Moving the consent docket, subject to individual consideration. There, there is a, an amendment to the consent docket. Uh, which has, any, has everyone received a copy of it? It's a, it, yes. item Ms. N. Mr. Chairman, the, for that item, we simply added the phrase um, aqua portion $35,000 to your posting. I believe in, in other respects it is the same. So the, the amendment clarified the dollar amount aqua was committing. Um, in addition, yep. It just adds the, the part in parenthesis that shows that we're only paying half of that. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's, that's my understanding. Who's it, paying the other half? The Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust. So it's just all city money. It is. Revenue, rate payer revenue, but city money. Okay. The, uh, um, item 3D uh, requests authorization to advertise plans and specifications for a sewer project that is related to item um, 5D, 5A, an item for individual consideration. Uh, I we entered into a contract with a contractor to construct a relief line. Uh, through the progress of the project, we ran into numerous utility crossing uh, concerns, uh, which changed some of the project. Uh, the Contractor um, work uh, used up most of the change order that's permitted under state law. And so uh, we've been in negotiations with that contractor as to uh, either the completion of the project or the closing out of the project and mutual termination by, uh, for convenience. We need to proceed with completing the project because it is a project that we have a consent order for uh, and also a civil uh, agreement on in a prior case where we had a backup situation in a large uh, apartment complex. And so we need to proceed with and complete this project. And so we've been in, in discussions with legal counsel for the contractor and we're continuing to work on that, which is why we also have the associated item later on for individual consideration where we authorize the general manager and legal counsel to continue to negotiate potential settlement of the existing claims and the closing of the project. Oh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, closing of the contract, whereas the project will be completed pursuant to this agenda item on the consent document. Any other questions or comments about that? Yes, sir. I would tell you, also on the consent docket is a lease of, is the formalization of the lease for what we have previously called the Kitchen Lake property, moving it forward in the, uh, process of, of becoming a park. And finally, the uh, item AC, that's item AA, item AC buys the easement on which we'll place booster station 25 on the southeast corner of airport property, the Will Rogers World Airport property. Okay. Any more questions concerning the consent docket? Comments? I have a motion? We need a second. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. Voting, please. Consent docket is approved. Next item is the concurrence docket. There are six items on the concurrence docket. Move the concurrence docket for individual or uh, with individual consideration. Second. A motion and a second to approve the concurrence docket. Are there comments or questions on any of the items on the on the docket? Hearing none, voting please. Concurrence dockets approved. Next item is item 5. Each one of these matters may be, must be considered in, separately. The first one is item 5A, resolution authorizing the general manager and municipal counselor's offices to resolve contract difficulty with Red Cliff, Inc. Move approval. 
Second. A motion and a second to approve. Are, are there any comments from staff about that? This, is this one we just talked about? Yeah. It is. Okay. In, in a few words, it's possible. What was the nature of the conflict? There were multiple uh, utility line crossings that were not identified in the original plans, which required the line to be lowered. That's true enough words? That's true enough. That's close, anyway. Okay. I have a motion and a second to approve item 5A. Voting, please. Item 5A is approved. Next item is item 5B, a joint resolution with the Lake Atoke Association concerning vehicle restrictions on the Lake Atoka Reservoir. I'll move approval. Second. A motion and a second to approve item 5B. Are there questions or comments? Hearing none, voting please. 5B is approved. Next item and the last item on the, uh, this kind is a, uh, an item to enter into executive session. Is there a need for an executive session? I don't think at this time. Move to strike the item. Second. I have a motion and a second to strike item 5C. Voting, please. Item 5C considered stricken. Next item is item for trustees. Trustees, Trustee Ryan. Nothing, Mr. Chairman. Anyone have any comments? Marsha, can you uh, uh, give us just a quick update on, on the, uh, just the rains we had over the weekend? and. Happy to. We got a gracious amount of rain, and I think it's going to help our drought position a little bit, but it didn't help lakes very much. The, generally, across the board, we got two inches of water on top of McGee Creek, and that's about how much the lake went up. Uh, generally, it's a lake levels today, um, like after it's down about 12 feet, the uh, uh, Lake Draper is making progress to recover. It's so 1168 and a half, about down about to 20 feet. As the other lake levels are similar, Lake Canton um, did not gain any appreciable volume of water uh, across the system. I'd say lakes are sitting at more than 50 percent as an aggregate, but in some cases, for example, Lake Canton, you're at about 45 percent, while others are very in the 90 percent range at, in southeastern Oklahoma. Again, a lot of rainfall is good for the next potential for runoff. Um, but Any other comments? Mr. Chairman, uh, just a procedural issue. On the concurrence doc on item 4A, Council uh, struck that from the agenda this morning, so I don't see a need for the trust to concur with that item. So if it could be... Uh, the action rescinded and then a motion to start on 4A. Do we need to reconsider it first? Yes, reconsider, rescind, and start. I move we reconsider the item. Second. Motion is second to rescind previous action. Voting, please. Reconsider. Actually, that was reconsider. Now I, I would ask that we rescind our previous action. Okay. Second. Motion is second to rescind the previous action. Voting, please. I move to strike the item. Second. I have a motion and a second. Voting, please. Done. Um, next item is status report from the utilities department. Um, we described for you the lake levels. Um, water pumpage continues to be high. About um, actually treated water is about six percent less than this time last year, but as you know, last year we were at, we were at the end of ex very extreme record weather, so these remain to be very high pumping numbers for this time of year. Um, July and August of 2011 set two new records for the first and second highest month ever. Uh, July and August of 2012 moved into the number two and number four slots on the monthly pumpage records. Finally, we had a large a number of meter sales over the summer. We're, we're um, a, a large percentage ahead of last year, but 378 meters in one month in, this, in August was uh, 
typical of what we were seeing in the 2007-2008 time frame, so we're really excited about that. So essentially we re recovered to the level we were before the recession. Depression. It feels good. Yeah, it feels good. It's only a couple of months in the, in the first few months of the year, but it, it's good. Very exciting. And, and we could take that in consideration when we do water planning? Yes, we see this, we, we feel confident we see a slight uptick in growth in the area consistent with what we've read in these reports um, and are, are very pleased. The, uh, the final uh, item from the general manager is a presentation from Smith Roberts, Baldishweiler, and Coelho Engineers, along with Sam Simendi, our, our design manager, about a capital program in which we have planned to build a pipeline consistent with the master plan's 2003 recommendation between the Lake Draper water system and the Hefner water system. The engineers this afternoon will tell you more about a good creative solution that they've identified through a lot of, a lot of detailed work that we're pleased to have them present for us. Thank you, Marshall. Yeah, my name is Carl Baldeschweiler, Smith Roberts Baldeschweiler. Uh, I'd like to introduce Tom Crowley with Colo Engineers, our partner on this project. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to make a presentation this afternoon on our, our study and our findings of our report. Again, this evalu it was an evaluation of connecting the Draper water system to the Hefner water system. Uh, introduction uh, agenda this afternoon is introduction and transfer concepts, transfer scenarios, results, recommendations, and CIP impact. Uh, the purpose of our project was to determine the capital improvements necessary to provide increased resistance to a decrease in the availability of North Canadian water supply. Uh, we examined two alternatives. One, like Marcia said, was the uh, raw water transfer of the pipeline from Draper to Hefner. And we also analyzed the finished water transfer to modify the distribution system and enable um, wastewater treatment plant to supply a greater portion of the uh, system demand. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn over to Tom Crowley. He is our planning specialist with Colonel Engineers to go through our analysis. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, as you know, the two transfer concepts, the first one is taking a look at the raw water transfer. And basically what we would do is take raw water from Lake Draper, transfer it through a 35-mile pipeline, up to Lake Hafner and we you know connect it to the canal and dump it into the lake and what it entails is there you see on your screen the Draper water treatment plant uh, constructing a 48 inch it depends on the uh, amount of transfer and we'll get into that but uh, co constructing a pipeline in a series of booster pump stations to pump raw water from uh, Lake Draper up to the canal to where it can be transported to uh, Lake Hafner and we want to compare that to a finished water transfer concept. And, and to understand how a finished water transfer concept works is you have to kind of break down on how your demands are distributed throughout the year. So here on the y-axis, you have water demands. And in the x-axis, you have over the year of how those demands look. And this is kind of a, a simple schematic, but it kind of gives you a good understanding of you have your base winter demands, which are kind of a low, low level of demand that you see in the winters, and then a peak demand in the summer. And the important thing to note is your distribution system and your treatment plants are sized for that peak day demand. So meaning that the rest of the time of the year, you have a lot of unused capacity both in your treatment plants and in your pipelines associated with your distribution system. <coughs> Okay, so the idea of the finished water transfer system is, well, let's use that size to our, our advantage. Let's use that capacity to our advantage and increase the amount we're pumping from one of the treatment plants, meaning Draper, during the winter, and allowing Hefner to do what it needs to do in summer to keep the pressures that we need to deliver water to your customers. So there kind of you have a, a schematic, and I'm going to take a little, bit, a little bit of time explaining this. This is your distribution system. And the green color indicates the influence of a majority of Draper water into your distribution system, where, it, where it's distributed during a typical peak day in 2011. We use 2011 as a benchmark because that was when your distribution system was basically pushed to the max. 
and we have in purple uh, the overholster service area, roughly uh, what it supplied during a peak day. And then there in red, you see what Hefner supplies during a typical peak day. Well, right now, during the winter time, uh, this is a typical day in 2011, uh, when overholster is shut off line, the Hefner actually takes over its service area. And you really want to use Hefner uh, when, when you can because that's the least expensive water for you. Uh, it comes down to North Canadian and it takes a lot of money to pump the Draper water. So it makes sense to use the Hefner water to its maximum ability. Uh, and you've done that within your distribution system and your, your distribution system is sized to do that. So the finished water transfer concept in the wet years when you have a lot of water from the heifer supply, let's use it. Um, let's use it during the winter. Let's not change anything that we're doing. And use, let's use the uh, Hefner water treatment plant, uh, increase the production uh, to keep the overholster plant online until the uh, Hefner plant's about 150, and decrease the production of the uh, more expensive water at the Draper water treatment plant. However, when that supply in the North Canadian system, uh, and here you see that same schematic, but when that supply in the North Canadian system uh, is diminished or not there for you to use, let's preserve it during the winters and use it when we need it during the summers, okay? So what that would entail is, from a basic conceptual standpoint, is we would use Overholzer as a booster pump station to use it as a central facility for transfer of Draper water. And so, in, in, in other words, we would be using it during the winter to maximize the production of the Draper water to preserve that Hefner supply when we need it for when it's sized for in the summer. So, for example, this is what it would look like in a winter, typical wintertime scenario, in which the Hefner water treatment plant production has reduced capacity significantly. Uh, so we preserve that supply during uh, times of known drought and we would use the Draper plant to take over the system during the winter. And we would do improvements to allow that to happen, okay? The next is, okay, well, we're, we've got these two transfer scenarios. How much do we want to transfer? How much water should we really size the system to transfer? You know, as you know, in, in anything, the bigger the water you transfer, the higher the cost. So we wanted to look at several different options. So this graph shows a capacity, uh, and we use the target year of 2031 uh, that shows the supply available from the North Canadian. It can vary, and the rest has to be transferred either from a raw water or a finished water standpoint. So we developed several scenarios uh, that are associated with various levels of water availability from the North Canadian system. So the first one, if you see, it's R1 and F1. So both the raw and finished water scenarios were compared. And we're talking about the description of yield in the next column. It's called a wet year. And what we call that wet year is the raw water firm yield of 80,000 acre feet from the North Canadian. And that represents your current permitted levels of yield available from that system. So a wet year means you've flowed all you can, you've captured all that you can from the North Canadian system. And it's important to no note that the, even in year 2031, that when you capture all that flow during a wet year, you will still need a, some sort of transfer from, either, whether it be raw or finished, from the Draper system up to the Hefner system. Because the demand projections for that area shows that that growth in that, around that area, the demands is going to be higher than what's available in the North Canadian supply no matter what yield you have. So the next scenario is called a reliable yield, and that was R2 and F2. So we're looking at both raw and finished again, and a reliable year is about a 50,000 acre feet per year. And that was a planning number that was used in the master plan, okay, for the amount coming from the North Canadian. That's kind of the benchmark uh, for the reliable yield for the North Canadian. We'll get into uh, what we looked in to as far as how that corresponds with your historic droughts. The next one is the historic drought of 1952 and 54, which resulted in a yield of about 35,000 acre feet in over a three year period averaged. And then the final one is an extreme drought 
that has to do with a particular scenario that was generated based on that historic drought. That, to my knowledge, has never occurred. It may have occurred back before we kept records, but that has never occurred. So then we have to classify all of these droughts with respect to the historical periods of time that we were looking at. And this is about 100 years of flow data that we had from the Canton Lake North Canadian system. And basically what it says is that a reliable year means that three out of 10 years, you're going to have 50,000 acre feet or less from the North Canadian system. And a severe drought scenario, for example, maybe one out of 10, out of 10 years over that 100 year period, we had a, uh, a record. That was the record. One out of the last 100 years it only occurred once. Okay. And the worst case drought has never occurred. So we wanted to look at those scenarios and size systems based on all four of those scenarios and compare. So let's take a look at the results. Okay, on the, on the uh, y-axis you have a cost in millions of dollars and that includes um, the, all the elements that are associated with, with every scenario. Um, the raw water transmission main, finished water, pump stations, implementation costs, engineering, acquisition, and treatment. And there on the x-axis, you have all the different scenarios. Remember, R1 and F1 have to do with the typical year. You have all the yield associated with the uh, North Canadian system coming down. The second one is your planning level estimate. And then as you get further to the right, your droughts get more severe. So this slide tells me two things. One, finished water transfer is less expensive uh, on, in every scenario. But as the droughts get more severe, the difference between the two reduces. One of the advantages of a finished water scenario rather than the raw water scenario is picture if you, if you have a raw water line the only time that you can use it is when these two ends become connected. That means you have to invest an enormous amount of capital to construct the raw water line, not necessarily the booster stations, because you can construct the booster stations uh, later on you know, uh, as capacity is needed. But what this line represents, the orange line above, represents the total capital investment over time. So imagine you have to sink all that money into a, a raw water line to get any use out of it. And then as capacity is needed, you add booster pump stations. And it may be more, may be less, depending upon the amounts you transfer. And but however, in a finished water scenario, you're able to do improvements within the distribution system and able to stage that much more uh, from a fine tuning as the need arrives. So it allows you to level, level your costs better. Another advantage in doing a finished water scenario is system redundancy. So, for example, let's take a look at the system capacity in MGD. That's on the y-axis. Okay, that's the amount that you can serve from the Hefner water treatment plant. So let's just say we had a scenario uh, like in May 10th of 2010, I believe, in which Draper was taken offline uh, and you had to, you know, use what you could. Uh, under this scenario, because we've made distribution system improvements to make it much more flexible to transfer finished water over the two systems, uh, for example, in the raw water scenario, if that were to happen, we could only service about 50 MGD of your total system demand with the Hefner water treatment plant. However, with making distribution system improvements with the Raper water treatment plant offline, we can transfer almost uh, 110 MGD across the system. Just to give you a perspective, your current annual average demands were about 108. So about half the time you could use the Hefner water treatment plant to make up quite a bit if you lost Draper. And vice versa, um, because the system is designed uh, to transfer Draper water and under most conditions, um, a under condition in which we would lose Hefner. Uh, again, you have the system capacity that we were able to serve on the y-axis and the two different scenarios on the x, indicating that the finished water transfer, we could transfer up to 150 MGD of system demands with the Hefner plant entirely offline. 
where under a raw water scenario, we'd be right at about your annual average demand currently. Uh, there also begs the question, to what capacity should the Hefner water treatment plant be expanded? Well, we wanted to take a look at three different scenarios. Uh, currently, the Hefner capacity is about 100 MGD, and that's uh, there at the far right. Uh, we wanted to look at expanding it to 150 MGD, and, and therefore expand it to 200 MGD. Uh, the reason we looked at that is because 200 MGD was recommended in the master plan along with the raw water pipeline. So we wanted to look at uh, what realistically the capacity would be. And I'm glad we did, because looking at the costs associated with a finished water transfer system, uh, having Hefner at a capacity of 150 MGD makes much more sense from a cost perspective uh, and from a distribution system improvement perspective. Uh, so in conclusion, because of that, uh, the lower cost, the ability to strengthen the system, the non, some of the uh, numerous non-economic factors, we're recommending that you approve the finished water transfer scenario, TR1, which involves the following. Uh, we're going to transfer finished water. Uh, the Hefner water treatment plant will be about 150 MGD, and this is at year 2031. And by 2031, we need to expand Draper to 200 MGD. And that would be a reliable year planning level, kind of the middle planning level uh, of a, a drought that uh, is not frequent but does occur. Uh, firm yield of about 50,000 acre feet from the North Canadian resulting in an annual average transfer need of about 60,000 acre feet a year in 2031. Okay, so this system is sized up to 2031. And the total CIP costs are about 549 million associated with that. So let's get into just a little bit of the details associated with how we're going to do that. Uh, and really the key element is to use the overholster water treatment plant as a booster pump station. Um, the overholster water treatment plant could be used uh, to treat as long as, you, as, long as its need uh, is there. But uh, you could construct a finished water booster station at the overholster water treatment plant that would allow us to transfer water back and forth. So during wet years where Hefner, uh, the supply is bountiful and the demands aren't quite there, we can use what we, what we need from Hefner, use that least less, less expensive supply. And in Draper, in times of drought, we can use that to pump Draper water and spread that around. Uh, there's some other distribution system improvements that need to be done. You have an inner ring, uh, and one of the benefits that I neglected to mention, I'll mention here, is you actually have an inner ring, and one of them is a 24-inch line that was built in the 40s. Uh, with this, Improvement allows you to replace that line with a bigger line to make a, a big 48-inch ring from which we can distribute water across um, the entire system. So it's a pretty elegant solution. Um, it minimizes your capital investment, but it also provides you some, uh, some good system strength. Just to kind of give you a visual interpretation of how it would look, um, this is how it would look with the overpulsor water treatment plant online in year 2031 with the Hefner water treatment plant at 150 MGD and the Draper water treatment plant pumping about 187 MGD. That's to serve a total system demand of about 337 MGD in a peak day. Okay, So we would use Hefner uh, because we need it. We need the distribution system as sized as such. And there you can see the red would be the area in which Hefner would serve and the green would be the area in which Draper would serve. It's interesting to note that overholster pump station is using Hefner water in the summer. In the winter, conversely, we would, during drought years, we would back Hefner down in the winter, take advantage of the large size of the distribution system and allow the finished water to transfer from Draper across the system. Again, the green is Draper and the red is Hefner. And then Sam will kind of, uh, Sam, we've been working a lot with Larry and Sam on this uh, because it involves so many different parts of your water system. And Sam will come up and explain a little bit on how it impacted your CIP overall. Thank you. Uh, we 
looked at all of the work that uh, uh, Mr. Crowley and uh, Carl have done, and uh, we brought it into uh, our CIP and to see what the effect is on our CIP. Uh, as uh, Mr. Crowley explained, the hinge pin of all of this stuff is conversion of the uh, overhauls of plant into a booster, resistant, booster station where you can uh, boost the uh, water to the north and west. And then uh, also on the east side of town is uh, the addition of another booster station that takes the water from Draper to the east side of town uh, to, uh, to take care of that need during peak days. Now, essentially what we have seen here, there's a lot of overlap between what the recommendations uh, were in, the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this work. Uh, on this particular slide, it shows the major uh, trade-off here. Uh, the uh, brown dash line that you see over there is the proposed, or one of the routes that we had looked at for the raw water line. Uh, with the new uh, uh, finished water transfer scenarios, all we're adding to the CIP is what you see there in solid red. So the net effect is not a whole lot in terms of what we need to do. So there was a lot of those overlaps, and we used the new numbers, updated numbers from their work uh, in, in the new CIP, and it was a better fit than before in the previous CIP. And it actually reduced the cost. Uh, and uh, in order to show that stuff, you know, we used three different time steps to, to evaluate that. Uh, we looked at in the short term the current CIP, 2013 to 2017, and uh, the cost differential is about the saving of one and a half million dollars. Doesn't seem to be a whole lot, so it's on the short term it's it's uh, it's, it's it's close. On the uh, kind of medium term, by 2021, uh, the effect is a lot more. Uh, you know, there's a saving of four million dollars. But if you look at this whole thing over a, a much more extended uh, duration for the CIP up to 2060 we'll see about like $58 million saving in the total cost. And uh, the swap is very simple. You know, inclusion of these new projects into the CIP and elimination of uh, two projects, essentially the raw water line and the expansion of Hefner to 200 MGD. Uh, and that will be it. We'll be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Oh, this is a really good evaluation. I, I've, been, I've been interested in this for, for, for a long, long time, and I, I, I think it's a really good recommendation. I think it's a good, really good analysis. I think it will serve us uh, well, well in the long term. We really don't give up much on it. Uh, and uh, uh, just I think it saves money and provides you a lot of flexibility. Because it represents a significant change to the capital program and because we're looking at other long-range capital investments at this time, we, we've asked your uh, financial advisor to assist us with rate impacts so that, uh, of the capital program, uh, or, pardon me, income needs resulting from the capital program so that we can begin to massage further uh, the, the very large investments that we anticipate as we pursue the new Otaku pipeline and other improvements. So, we, so financial analysis is underway. We would expect that next year we'll present a slightly different capital program reflecting these improvements um, and uh, have an opportunity to visit with you about rate planning and uh, cost of service analysis to move us toward um, your next rate plan in 2014. This, the capital program is a key element. This is really, again, an elegant solution uh, to a complex problem. What happens if we don't do this? What's the, let's say 15 years from now, we haven't done this, what happens? Well, the problem is getting water to the people in the summertime. No, I understand. Yeah. I, 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 I well, it it so then it becomes a... The cost of doing it it seems to me this is a perfect argument to get back into the discussion about whether or not we ought to have impact fees or not. Because this is not for people that are have on the system right now. Right, this, this is for... Marginally, it is. It is yeah. some, there's some value. But the big value is for people that haven't built their house yet. Correct. And Correct. We were looking at 2031. And yeah. so when we start talking about are we going to spend ratepayers' money today to pay for that, and these ratepayers, if they're even close to my age, they're not going to be here to enjoy it anyway. 
uh, we ought to be thinking, I think, about this is the kind of a building block that we ought to look at to, uh, to justify um, uh, impact fees. I mean, because this is a perfect example of, what, of why you need to have impact fees. Because the system now is with, within margin is adequate for the people that are on it. This is, this is a fee, this is something for people 18 years out. And I think, I don't, I'm not arguing we shouldn't do it. I'm arguing whether it should all be paid for by the people that are on the system now or it ought to be paid for as we go forward. Obviously our impact fees are very low and there's growth potential there. And I, I, I agree that they, they, they should be increased and probably increased substantially. Um, it's a balance between the ratepayers. I mean, Sardis and in the, in, in the parallel pipeline down to the, the, the southeast could be argued in that same vein, Mr. Mr. Wyatt. That exactly. you know that, that, that you know that isn't really needed for the existing, but it's going to be needed needed for the future. Well, so it, it, the fact of the matter is, I, I think you're, you're you're absolutely right that we need to take a look at probably a three prong approach. But you need to look at the impact fees. We need to look at water conservation, and we need to look at, I mean, at uh, impact fees are a tough pill to swallow. I, I know they are for me. I mean, I've, there are a lot of people, the developers, don't like them, obviously, at all. They don't want anything to do with them. But this is a poster child for what an impact fee would go for, as is the addition of Lake Sardis, as is the addition of the new, all the litigation we're in over that. Uh, another question, totally divorced from sure. the economics of it. What, will this have any impact on lake levels at Atoka, at McGee Creek, at Draper? At I, I don't, I, not necessarily, but it will allow you the flexibility to manage those lake levels better than you do now. Okay, so because of your, you have the power to transfer within your distribution system. Now, I can't, if during a drought scenario, it would allow you to preserve the supply in Hefner Lake, okay, and, and, and allow you to well, keep well, that. The only reason we need to manage lake levels more than we do now is for recreational purposes. They're managed very adequately for the production of water, are they not? So the only reason to be to manage them better, not better in quotes, would be to provide for more recreational purposes. And if it would lower the lake levels in Atoka and increase them in Hefner, sure for no other purpose than quote managing the lake level, end quote, Seems to me that's an expense that I'm not sure I'm willing to put on the right. ratepayers. And, and we did not look at that from that perspective. We only looked at it from an engineering water supply and water production and, perspective. And, 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 and I think that's a practical consideration is whether yeah. or not this is going to be later used to manage the lake level for recreational purposes. If so, that's another cost that ought to be built into. Right, right. I, 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 all I say from an engineering standpoint is that we have enough flexibility in the distribution system to allow you to manage your lakes from much more right. than what you used to before. And, and, and we're learning a lot about lake level management through the free drive, whether we've had the last couple of years, uh, and, and looking at technology to help us a little bit better with that. But um, for, for example, the the value, the value of the terminal reservoir, so there is recreational value, of course, even, even though that wasn't its original purpose, the, but the value of the, the large lakes in Oklahoma City is that our supply comes from a long way away, and that, and that gives us a place to, make, to store water to make certain that we have it. So there is an element of lake level management and keeping lakes adequately full um, for the purpose of making certain that you've got it there and in case you have shortages at, at one of your distant supply lakes or difficulty bringing it in, for example, at Lake Canton. Lake Canton's a long way away, and when the river basin is dry, it may not make sense for us to attempt to take water from Lake Canton. So that's a, a management uh, of the system uh, decision that staff makes that contributes sometimes to lower lake levels in Lake Hefner. Uh, but better production of our water rights when they're delivered to Lake Hafner at a different time. Okay, I've gone afield on that, but my, but my point would be there's a value to holding a lot of water in town for long-term supply, avoidance of contamination, uh, other, other security kinds of reasons that right. is considered. Well, my concern, I, I, I wouldn't want anybody to think I'm not concerned about managing the lakes for recreational purposes because, I mean, 
if anybody that didn't understand the recreational value needs to have the lake in their area shut down for two years like it has been at Draper. I mean, I get phone calls, for, and they're not from people wanting to know where's my water because they're still getting water. They want to know why they can't fish, why they can't water ski, why they can't jet ski. I mean, so I will. I know it's a big impact, and I, I don't want to do anything to denigrate it. My, my concern is if it costs money to keep those levels balanced, then those that are and it doesn't have anything to do with providing good, clean water at an inadequate supply, then those that are enjoying that benefit probably ought to be the ones that pay for it. I, I think we can look at that and theoretically split it out, give you some concepts. Of are you suggesting, Pete, that we put a, some kind of a fee associated with the boating and fishing activities? On the uh, not necessarily, but I think we ought to look at it. We ought to know what that cost, if that's part of the cost, if the cost is, and I'm not harping on your word, the, no, 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 balancing no. the lake levels, but if, if you're balancing lake levels for any other reason than the adequacy of the water supply, which is, they're balanced well enough right now for the adequacy of the water supply. So if we're going to balance them, then the only, the only beneficiary I can see of that are recreational users. Right. That's, I'm not criticizing that right. either. I, 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 it's a important, especially Hefner, I think, it's very important that that recreational use of that lake continue. It's maybe the nicest urban lake that I know of anywhere when it's full. It's a beautiful lake. And, and, uh, and so I'm not, I'm not being critical of it. But I, but I am concerned that we, we, we put the price of doing that where the cost is. We, wherever the cost is, those... Uh, and w at least we know what it is. If it's going to cost another dime, uh, thousand gallons to make sure the lakes are balanced for recreational purposes, well, maybe that dime needs to come from somebody besides some lady drawing Social Security that doesn't get to water ski very often. Well, Mr. Chairman, we only looked at the lake levels just from an engineering perspective. But Marsha's right that what we have is can be used that way to determine right. that value. And we didn't, we didn't do that because we were more of an engineering company rather than looking at a recreational well, aspect. I agree with what uh, the manager, uh, uh, both the managers have said about it. I'm, it's a good, I, I appreciate the study. It's well done, I think. And I think it, it's going to feel some more commentary as we go along, as well it should when you look at the price tag of it. But uh, now, now if Carl could give us about five minutes on OU Texas football. <laughs> It doesn't so. take man. It <laughs> took five minutes. Just five minutes. <laughs> just, maybe just re repeat the score over and over for five yeah. minutes. I only had to watch Music for five to minutes because it was <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. But we appreciate uh, the opportunity to work on this project. It's been very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other comments? I don't mean I'm not wanting to cut the comments off. Of there. Anyway, I believe that's it. I believe that's a citizen to be heard. Are there no citizens? That's it. Thank you. We're adjourned.